this Nashville, Tennessee. I was living in Los Angeles for 40 years, and the last house I lived in, uh, I bought after it sat on the LA housing market for over a year. No one wanted it, because it's this ugly chunk of modern cement with steel beams and glass uh, surrounded by a tall retaining wall and camel dung brown window sills. I walked into this place, my heart was thudding in my chest. I thought it was beautiful. I said, I like this place, and the realtor hugged me. Please buy it, please buy this ugly house. So I bought the ugly house. So why did I buy the ugly house? Because at the end of the day, I'm kind of sort of a peacenik, and I want a house that reeks of deterrence in an effort to meet American crime statistics halfway. Inside my home, I do not want lethal capacity. Uh, I do not want the guns of Navarone, an attack dog, uh, a, a death drone, or, or a security detail. I want to have a house that a bad guy can't get into. Because I've been to about 90 countries. The only time I ever almost been killed, which is three times, was consistently in the United States of America. I think I've been to almost every single axis of evil country, and I think they all said shukran and gave me tea. It was the <laughs> USA that tried to kill me over and over again, including bullets flying by me, a friend of mine not making it through, and me cleaning up his human remains on the lawn the next day. It puts a dent in, in the human psyche. Definitely put a dent in mine. And so I'm averse to home invaders, stalkers, burglars, and psychopaths pursuing me. And I've had all of them making multiple attempts to get into places I have lived in my life. And I'm not into it. I am a workaholic. I live alone. I work alone. I don't want to make trouble with anyone. I don't go to the disco. I don't drink. I don't dance. I don't have fun. I work. I'm not putting up bricks in the hot sun. I, I I work on dopey books, radio shows. I come up with, with stories for the stage. I make things that people might like. I am obsessed with it. I like to sleep between four and five hours a night, work out, eat good food, and do lots of work. So I want to have a, an impenetrable fortress I can live in that a bad guy will look at like, I can't get in there. I guess I'll just leave Henry alone. And they'll leave me alone. And I can work until this time next year when me and Dick Chase will die together. We'll hold hands and jump. And so I'm going to be And so that's all I want. And I've been living in that place for about 10 years until two Februarys ago. It's 3.30 in the morning, and I'm sitting fully clothed in bed, laptop down. I'm unable to sleep. 3.30 is like kind of like the witching hour. I'm up, and I hear a sound outside my house that I've never heard before. And my little bedroom is on top of the garage. And it sounds like someone's directly below me, punching or kicking the garage door. So I go to the window and look down, and there's a guy punching my garage door. Young man, about 5 foot 11, 20 something years of age, dark hair, windbreaker jeans, a backpack, next to him, one hand it has a cell phone, and the other hand is a fist, punching, casually punching my garage door. I feel my body flush cold, my heart rate accelerates because this is the sum and total of my nightmare. I bought this house with a tall wall and a big gate to be left alone, and the guy somehow got over the wall, and then he's like punching my garage door, like, you can't get in, like, what are you doing? So I realized I gotta call the cops. As I told you before, I want this century to end better than it began. And, and so I don't like cops, I don't hate cops, I'm terrified of cops, so uh, they scare me. And so I need to call the cops, why? Because if this guy's just a normal burglar, he's gonna see very quickly, he's not getting in. So what if he goes over the wall, hikes up the road, and breaks into my neighbor's house? And I know, my next door neighbor, I've never met them, but I know there's two kids and two parents in there. What if they leave their back door open, the guy goes in there, and he hurts or kills someone, like he, he kills the kids? In my opinion, that's on me, because I didn't warn the neighborhood there's a bad guy there, so I gotta do something. And so, unfortunately for me, my cell phone does not get reception in the narrow canyon in which I live. So I run downstairs to the landline, and I'm about to call 911, and I look at this guy, and I notice that he's picked up his backpack, he's now at my front door, knocking politely, and ringing the doorbell, like, what are you doing? Hi, I'm a polite burglar. And so I call 911, and I got that typical 911 exchange. 911 with your mercy. Hi, my name is Henry. I live alone in this impenetrable fortress because I have this whole thing about meeting crimes and just halfway in the like, Sir, no need to overshare. Please tell me what's going on. There's a man knocking on my door. Did you invite him? Uh, no. Uh, I need to, I need you to uh, tell me exactly what he looks like. And I give the, the woman the details and I said, can you please send two of Ellie's finest uh, to pick this guy up? Uh, sir, we're stretched rather thin tonight, as you know. Uh, women all over the city have guns now, and they're shooting with the men, so this is bodies at the so we're, we're throwing them in the trunk as best we can. We do the paperwork later. Uh, the LAPD will be with you in the next 15 minutes to 15, 15 hours, and so uh, open the gate and just wait for cops, and if anything escalates, please call back. 
And so I need to open the gate, which means I have to go through the door the guy's knocking on to go to the car to get the clicker. That's not an idea. So I go to the garage and I turn off the circuit that goes to the gate, and as a default, the gate opens. And so I know the gate is opening, I'll run back to the window to see the man's reaction to the gate opening, figuring if he's a bad guy, he'll conclude, homeowner's up, 911's been called, LAPD's on the way, there's the gate's opening, a clear way to get out, I don't want to go to jail, and he'll run. He doesn't run. He looks at the house for a minute, grabs his backpack, walks halfway down the driveway and sits. I'm like, okay, you are really, really weird. You are interesting. And so, about 37 minutes after I call for LAPD, a single cop car comes slowly driving up the narrow canyon road. By the time I'm outside, uh, they have the young man facing the wall handcuffed. One cop is going through his pockets. The other cop is standing in front of the cop car waiting for the homeowner. Knowing that cops in Los Angeles are pretty tense all the time, because people don't like them. I don't want to upset a cop and catch multiple nine millimeter slugs in my upper center mass just because I own a home. So I have my hands way over my head and I announce myself. Good morning, law enforcement. I am the homeowner. You have the right one handcuffed facing the wall. And the two cops see me and they, they see uh, this old man in a white t-shirt with like abundant salsa stains all over <laughs> his shirt and they realize I'm not a threat to anyone. And I thought, I am unarmed, but whatever. Sir, please approach, you can put your hands down. Putting the hands down, going towards front pants pockets with nothing into a sadness midget memory. Sir, no need to overshare, please walk on. <laughs> so I'm looking at one cop in front of me, I'm looking at the cop on the side, and the cop on the side is like going through the man's pockets. And he pulls out what looks like a card, like an ID card. And he holds up the card up to the young man's face, and he says to the young man, So, it's okay in Finland to jump over someone's wall and knock on the front door at 3.30 in the morning? And, and the young man goes, No, it's not. So you think it's okay to do that in the United States of America? And the young man says, Henry invited me. I'm like, Oh, oh, no, 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 no. And both cops are going, Hell no. So the cop in front of me goes, Okay, I get it. Sir, you've got two options here. You can have the man arrested for trespassing, we'll take him downtown to the Twin Towers holding facility, and we'll put him in like a 24-hour hold. He'll probably be able to bond out sooner, that's really not our department. Or, you can let him go with a warning, and we'll take him from your property and take him to any address uh, he desires, but we'll warn him. If you come back to the property, then you hop over the wall, and the homeowner calls us and we catch you, you will go to jail. So, uh, citizen, what do you want to do? And in an effort to make the uh, century end better than it began, it is incumbent upon me, in my opinion, to not screw up the life of a young person and understand that we humans are incredibly complex. And so what if it is this first night uh, for this young man in the United States of America? And for the crime of hopping over my wall and knocking on an iron door, he is handcuffed and taken downtown and put into a large holding facility at Twin Towers downtown with like 150 really scary men. How do you think he gets through the night without being assaulted or otherwise torn limb from limb? I don't like his odds, and I don't want to put this young man in those odds, because in my opinion, he's got another 60 years of life. It's not for me to screw him up. So I said, you've got to let him go with a warning. And both cops looked at me, are you sure? And I, I'm barely a high school graduate, you can tell. I'm not articulate, but I do have a point of view. And I said, yeah, you got to let him go with a warning. And they looked at me like, we well, you know something you don't know. And they took him away. So I go to the garage, and, and I close the gate. I go back to my bed and I just sit there unable to sleep, completely wired. And so at 9.30 the next morning, I fall asleep. I'm just fully clothed. My head lists to the side. At 10.25, I'm awoken by the sound of my doorbell ringing. I'm like, really? And I look out the window, broad daylight. He's there with his backpack. Ding dong, I call the cops again. I'm like, hey, it's Henry, the overshare. I called you in zero three thirty. Is he back? He's back. And I asked for the cops to come and get him. Sir, I know it's tough traffic. It'll be between three hours and 45 days before you get here. And so I go downstairs with a landline in my pocket in case anything escalates. And I listen to the young man knocking on my door and hitting the doorbell. About three minutes of that, uh, suddenly there's silence for about three minutes. The silence is broken by the sound of the young man who's now on the uh, the third floor deck, jumping up and down. There's one lonely deck chair the previous owner left, and he's smashing it on the ground. And I'm wondering, how did he get up there? My theory was, he went over my wall across my front yard cement parking lot, up the stairs through a room that holds a water heater, slid down a clay tile roof. If you go that way, you fall to your death. But if you make a right and hop over a low retaining wall, voila, you're on the deck. Two ways into the house. 
You can try to get in uh, through a door that goes to my bedroom, and I've replaced the original door with a Camel Dung Brown custom-made steel door that your friends in a stick of dynamite can't get through. But there's another room that holds gym equipment, and it has one pane of glass, of the brittle glass that you punch, and it explodes. And I realized this guy can punch the glass, be in the room, down the stairs, and like strangling me to death next to my beloved turntable. So I realized I, if I hear the sound of glass breaking, I've got 30 to 60 seconds of fighting for my life. I'm in fairly good shape, but he's young and I'm old, so we know who's going to win. So I realized if I hear glass breaking, I've got like about a minute and I'm going to die, terrified, next to my turntable. And I, I can't believe I thought this. I thought I was a better person, but I'm not. And it's, it's embarrassing, but it's funny, so I have to tell you. The thing that occurred to me when I'm considering I'm going to die was, I don't want to be killed! By a European, and I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea where that comes from. I would love to say I'm not that guy, but I'm obviously that guy. Especially from Finland, and I'm not trying to put down Finland. Finland is amazing. I love Scandinavia. But you get the idea of the Finnish people and like these loping Airbnbers going from like yoga class to a rave to strangulation. Like, well, I'm 20 something. I'm gonna like, like, like go into the house, and then I'm going to a party. Wee! And that's how I'm going to die. And so I'm going to die like choked out by a finish guy, dead, next to my turntable. And you're going to see, you know, angry men in lines going to used record stores with the entirety of my recorded catalog. Like, why are you trading those, those records in? Because Henry Rollins is dead. No, 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 you need to be playing them in a tribute. I can't do that, man. Why? Because he was killed by a finish guy. <laughs> like, what does that even mean? He died like a little bitch. Here, you can have him. Think that? I think I did. And so luckily for me, uh, the young man uh, abandons his pursuit of getting into the glass. And three minutes of silence later, he's back at my front door, knocking and ringing. I run to the garage, I disengage the circuit, the gates open, I go up to my bedroom window and look for him, and he's gone. And so about 45 minutes later, two cop cars come roaring up my driveway, four cops get out, guns drawn, super intense, and they do that thing, clear, clear, clear. I'm now looking down at them as they're looking up at me because I'm now on that deck looking down. I've got my hands way over my head. Good morning, law enforcement. I am the homeowner. I am unarmed. Like, so you can put your hands down. Not wanting to argue with you, but you can literally not see below my belt line because of the height of the retaining wall, which means you have no idea what is going on in my pants right now. <laughs> that did not land the way I wanted it to when I was trying to impart to officers is that I am unarmed, but you can't tell. So for our combined safety, how about you allow me to keep reaching for the sky? That's, that's permissible. And so I said, I'm sorry, you didn't get him. He was here, I wouldn't dare send you on a fool's errand, and to their credit, they believed me. Sir, you did the right thing. If you see the man on or near your property, you do not touch this man, you do not engage with this man, you do not talk to this man. You call 911, we'll show up and we'll get him. Got a citizen, got him, officer. All right then. You have a great American goddamn day. And they leave. And I close the garage doors and I'm now standing in my living room like, what do I do for the rest of the day? It was immediately obvious. I must prepare myself and my home for invasion. And so I need a command center, which will be the living room. This is a really comfortable couch. And there's a table where one can plot and plan for invasion. So I need gear to be ready for invasion. And so my gear was a bottle of water to remain hydrated for night two and no sleep, a flashlight to do three times on the hour perimeter checks, and my laptop. And so why would I need a laptop when I should be sitting silently, Chuck Norris ready, waiting to hear the sound of breaking glass or a sliding glass door, and then asphyxiation? Uh, why? And this is pathetic, but it's true, so I have to tell you. Uh, the older I get, the more I hurtle towards death, the more important it is for me to win every single thing I'm bidding on on eBay. Because <laughs> I'm at state and station in my life, if I don't win the thing, there's a very good chance I may never have the chance to hold it in my grimy mint. And after 20 so years of bidding aggressively and emotionally on eBay, I now find out that I've been bidding against the same four loser men for over 20 years. We are five men with no lives. We have this ridiculous idea that if we buy every iteration of every seven-inch record ever pressed by the damned, the Grim Reaper will give us a pass just because our record collection is so awesome. We are so 
so sad and so pathetic. We think if we buy records from our youth, a bunch of them, that somehow we'll reconnect with those great times when Reagan ruled the land. And so we are pathetic and we hate each other's guts because we have been winning and losing against each other for decades. And we all know who the other one is and we all have dreams of the other one's record collection exploding into flame and the record collection turning into this flaming river of vinyl going down the street, down into a sewer. So they hate me and I hate them. And so even if I'm being choked to death, I will go to my side and hit bid and I'll win. And as I'm, as I'm going in and out of consciousness, I'll hit the PayPal button and I'll close the deal. I don't even need to see the damn thing. I'll be happy knowing it's in the mail the next day. And in death, in hell, I can drink the tears of those four bastards who I beat and that will be good enough for me. So that is the pathetic person standing in front of me right now. And so I prepare for death or tomorrow. And so the sun goes down, I'm sitting in the dark, drinking the water, perimeter checks peeking on eBay, and the hours go by, it hits midnight and nothing has happened. It turns into the next day and nothing has happened. It turns into February 13th, the date that means nothing to you. I turn 60 years of age, sitting in the dark, clutching a flashlight and a bottle of water, waiting to be choked out by some, like, Airbnb tripping 20-something. Pathetic doesn't even begin to describe it. So finally the sun comes up and the spell is broken and the guy doesn't show up. And I feel like I've been jilted. Like, I've had a corsage and everything and you didn't come to take me to uh, the prom. And I wonder, what did I do to this guy to, to, to alienate him? I thought we had a thing going. Like, you come over, I call the cops. You come over, I call the cops. Which is like any Tinder date happening right now. And, and so, like, what did I do? Like, I, and like, do, do I bore you now? Have you found someone more desirable to stalk? Maybe it's my age. I think I'm going to stalk him tonight. Oh, wow. He turned 60. Well, what do you want to do tonight? Well, you're going to go stalk that guy. No, I can't. Well, why, why not? He turned 60. What does that have to do? I, I don't stalk the elderly, man. You know, I'm sick to leave him alone, you know? Like, wow, maybe I'm going into obscurity where now the stalkers don't even want me. And so the first profound emotion I felt as a newly minted six-year-old was rejection. Like, no one wants me. And so I, I moped around the rest of the day like, I waited all night for you, man. And so the next two days, I'm moping around like, no one even wants me anymore. And maybe he's stalking flea now. He's like, everyone likes me. <laughs> Anyway, I'm eating weird food that's been living in the bottom of the freezer, falling asleep while I'm making coffee, trying to remain vigilant. And so I'm sick of it. I'm sick of being incarcerated in my house. So I said, I'm done. I'm out of here. I gotta go do something and get back to normal. And so I should have gone to the grocery store because there's like nothing left in the house except like one like rock hard cliff bar from like 1428. So I decided I'm gonna do something I don't need to do just to show my defiance to Finland and anyone. And so I call my pal Sam, who's a professional framer. I call him at like 12.45 in the afternoon. Sam, it's your pal Henry. I'd like to drop him off an ancient punk rock poster for you to archivally frame. And he said, uh, do it when you want to come over. I said, 1 p.m., like, in, like in, in 17 minutes. He went, do it, hit the buzzer, I'll know it's you, I'll let you in. And so I grabbed my, my wallet, my car keys, my cell phone, the poster. I go to every window in the house and I look for the guy. He's, he's not around. And so I lock up the house, I run to my car, I drive to Sam's, I hit the buzzer at 1 p.m. He lets me in and we're looking at this poster. We're about one minute, two minutes into that when my leg is vibrating because of the cell phone. I pull it out and it says the dreaded word. Heidi. I'm like, oh no, I'm gonna get yelled at. So I hit the phone. Henry! Where are you right now? I'm with Sam, we're looking at a poster. Henry! ADT just called. As you know, ADT is the alarm company. And many, many years ago, since Heidi runs my life, she brought ADT into what was now the new house to adorn it with bells and whistles and sensors and alarms. So when window number six rattles, sensor number nine activates, and, uh, and the alarm company has to call someone responsible. And that's why they never call me. They call <laughs> Heidi. And like, I put my number on there, but ADT's like, can we just call you? Because he's an idiot. And so uh, every once in a while, a window would rattle, a sensor would go off, and they call Heidi, like, it's sensor number nine. Oh, it's that window that always rattles when the Santa Ana's come rolling through LA, just dismiss. And so on this day, again, they called Heidi. Henry, ADT just called. 
The motion detector in your living room has just been activated. The house is alarmed. LAPD is on the way. The guy is in your house. What are you going to do? I said, no problem. I'm going to get in my car, go back to the house, go into the house, and deal with this guy as a total improv. And she gets very angry. Henry, no! You'll kill him! Henry, no killing! As he tells me again and again and again. I can work with this, because I, as I told you before, I think almost everything is funny, including a man inside my living room. And I love having Heidi in this position where she's unstable and open to suggestion and easily made angry. Heidi, I never would have thought of killing him until you told me to. <laughs> until you commanded me to kill him, Heidi. Heidi, I will kill, I will kill them. Hey, hey, hey. I hung up on her. Oh, she's so mad now. I love it. And so I put the phone away. I go, Sam, I gotta go. He's like, this guy. I, go, I know. I gotta stalk. He's like, oh, that's awful. I go, well, we'll see. So look, Sam, uh, he's in my house. He's in your house? And what are you gonna do? I'm gonna go there right now and see what happens. Oh, Henry, no, 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 no. You don't talk to these people. You don't touch these people. You call 911 and you let LAPD handle this. I said, you know, Sam, a, thank you for your concern. B, I heard that from a uniformed professional a couple of days ago. However, I'm done with waiting for LAPD to show up and fix my little problems. So I'm going to leave today, Sam, right now. And one of two things is going to happen in the next half hour or so. I might call you in an attempt to reschedule this appointment, and you might see me later today if you can fit me in, walking into your shop covered with drying up uh, human blood, bits of brain matter, and bits of skull tissue, which means I have prevailed, or you may never see or hear from me again. And don't worry, I'm not ghosting you, bro. It means I've been killed. And Sam is what? Henry, don't die! Like, I'm not planning on dying, I've got a lot of plans. But look, humans, our water sacs of recessive traits and neuroses. And I think we've been comporting ourselves horribly for the, at least the last several centuries. I think all the gratuitous anger we extol upon each other via the internet and uh, otherwise is not the way to go. And so uh, I know that I am easy to kill. And it doesn't matter how much beef jerky I eat, I'm a very killable thing. Human life is fragile. And so my life is fragile. And so I might get killed in the next 15 minutes. And, Henry, don't die! I don't want to die. So look, Sam, I very well could be dead within an hour. And if that happens, if you don't hear from me ever again, Sam, Please keep the post. He's like, what? I go, what am I going to do with it, Sam? Like, well, what am I do with it? You're a framer. Frame it. What do I do? You frame it and you put it against that wall as a tribute. And underneath uh, the framed poster, you put a small shelf. A shelf, yeah. Because in two weeks, you're going to call your friend Heidi May and have her bring you an amber plastic pill bottle full of my ash and remains. And then put that on the shelf. Why would I do that? Because it becomes a curiosity and it draws people into your shop. And they're going to pick it up and say, Sam, what is this? Well, what do I say? Here's what you say. You say, hey, put that up to your ear and shake it. <laughs> And they'll say, what is it? And you're going to say, that's the ash and remains of Henry Rollins and Black Flag. And they'll go, ah! Ah! Oh. <laughs> This is pretty cool. How much? $4.99. Sold American. So I'm like, make some money, Sam. I think this is hilarious. Sam is like, Henry, no! Like, I'm leaving, Sam. And I may never see you again. Like, Henry, don't go! I'm leaving. And so I leave, and I get in my car, and I'm about half a mile below the driveway, and I see the guy walking down the road. He sees me, I see him, it's broad daylight. And so I pull into the opposite, the opposing lane to be physically closer to him. The cop said, don't talk to him. So I stick my head out of the window, and I start talking to him. I had no material prepared, so I busted an improv. And I said, and I quote, hey, Finland boy, come here. And he points at himself. I go, no, the other guy from Finland, come here. And I point at the passenger side door. And he walks around the front, and he opens the door. He goes, I go, get in. And he gets in and closes the door. And I got right in his face. I said, Please put your seatbelt on. And he, <laughs> so we're driving up the road. We're about 20 
20 seconds out from the driveway. I need a plan. Here's the plan. We'll pull into the driveway. I'll hit the clicker. The gate will open. I'll make a U-turn in my cement front yard parking lot, stand outside of the car on the passenger side, keep my eye on him, and wait for law enforcement. And so we're driving up the road, and I realize I have not said anything to this guy for like three or four seconds beyond the directive which he obeyed. I must reward good behavior. And so I come from the service industry. Everyone has to have a good time if I'm around. So I've got a big, big smile on my face, and I try, attempt to make low-impact Uber talk with this guy. So he says, so, you broke into my house. And he went, yes. And that's all he says. I'm like, I'll rephrase. You broke into my house. And he looks at me and he's like, are you hard of hearing? Like, not, not today, son. Not, not today. And so I said, why? And he said, because you're rich, and you can afford to lose a few things, and, you know, communism. I love a non sequitur. I said, did you just say, and you know, communism? Went, yeah, like, what kind of communism is he talking about? Like, Marxist communism, Leninist communism, Fox News communism, like, the great unknown. I don't understand what Anthony Fauci just did. He must be a communist. There you go. And so there's no time to have a pithy discussion as to which variant of communism he's talking about, because there's the driveway. We pull in, I click the clicker, the gate won't open. I look at my cell phone, and no reception. So my phone won't work, the, the clicker won't open the gate, and I've got a maniac strapped into my economy car. We are this far from each other. I have really planned this poorly. So I pull out of the driveway. What do I do? I just keep driving up the road. If I keep driving up the road, and we get all the traffic lights in about 15 minutes, We'll be pulling into gate four of Warner Brothers in Burbank, California. That's not a plan. So I turn the car around and go back down the hill. That is also not a plan. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm like, this guy is sitting looking at me. I'm looking at him. And so we get down the hill right about the point I picked him up. My cell phone springs back to life. So I make a right turn into a driveway that goes to a ravine that the city clears out a couple of times a year. The plan is get out of the car, go to the passenger side, keep my eye on him, call 911 from a different number, the cell phone, not the landline, from a different location, and have them redirect law enforcement and shoot the young guy, not the old guy. So I gotta do some mansplaining. And so I'm about to do that. The car is off, I'm about to get out, and the young man leans ahead of me and looks out my window, and he points, he was like, I've been living at the top of the hill up there. My backpack is up there. Should I go get it? And I said, why not? And we get out of the car together. And we walk side by side across the street. This is insane. He runs up the hill and comes back down with the backpack. I said, let me have that. He gives me the backpack. We go to the car. I pop the trunk. I throw it in. I close the trunk. I open the passenger door. Please get in. He gets in. Boom. Good boy. And so now I call 911. 911, what's your emergency? Hi, my name is Henry, the overshare, a now frequent contributor of content to the 911 chat line, which has been completely unimpressed. Sir, what is this about? I've been calling you from a different number in a different location. I give her the other number, she pulls up the report. Ma'am, I'm the man with the man from Finland. I've got an update. Lay it on me, sir. Ma'am, I've got him. What do you mean, I've got him? He's in my car. Is he in the trunk? Uh, no. <laughs> then where is he? Like, where else would he be? I said, ma'am. Front seat, passenger side, and I'll never forget this. She asked, is he handcuffed? And unfortunately, I you know, have to be truthful. So I said, no, but in my mind I'm thinking, yes, yes, he's handcuffed. Because ma'am, I always drive around Los Angeles with a pair of handcuffs in my car, in the trunk, in my go bag, with my roofies and my duct tape for when I go dating in the parking garage of the Beverly Center every weekend. And I said, no. How did you get him in there? Now, this, this is a trade craft, so I do not divulge sources and methods. So I get away from the car. I yell out the car window, hey, Finland boy, come in. And he got it in the car. Now, we're not really told me, which is an improv. I think someone on this call needs a 60 minute HBO stand up special, because I am on fire. See, kind of like the sir, uh, you've done everything wrong. You're in a great deal of danger. I need you to run away from your car right now. I said, I'm not running. It's my car. She was like, sir, there's nothing more I can do for you. I've redirected law enforcement. If anything escalates, like you getting choked to death, like let me know. And she hangs up. And so I realized I've got to call Heidi and give her the update. So I call Heidi. And she's a little angry about the last phone call. What do you want? Heidi, I've got him. Oh my God, you've killed him. Knowing the guy can hear Heidi yelling, they're like, the phone is here, the guy is there. And so I, I, I can use this. 
Well, I haven't killed him yet, Heidi. <laughs> and looking into his panicked eyes, murder is on my mind. And he's like, no! And he opens the door and tries to escape. I close it with my hip. He opens it, I close it with my hip. Big mama can't keep doing it all afternoon. We have to come up with a way to soften and demoralize this man, to make him sit like a, a model of compliance until LAPD shows up four hours from now. And what am I gonna do? So I remember my early days of being in Black Flag when I migrated from Washington, D.C. Uh, to Los Angeles. Being the new guy in the band, I am put on the dangerous uh, job of flyer duty, where I'm given a sack of offensive black flag flyers with a bucket of wheat paste. Instruction, go all over Los Angeles and uh, shellac metal light poles with the wheat paste. I fix the flyer, shellac the outside of the flyer uh, with more wheat paste and let the warm California <coughs> sun bake it into the metal. P.S. Do not get caught by the cops. They know who Black Flag is and they will kill you. I am not good at multitasking. I am good at doing one thing really intensely over and over and over again. It's what I was trained to do. So I immediately forget about looking out for LAPD. I am on flyer number three at a light pole at La Cienega and Halloway that still exists to this day. So I'm painting the paste on the flyer. A cop has been watching me. He gets out of the cop car, he gets this far from my face, and he starts yelling at me so loudly and so violently, I think I've lost my will to breathe. In cop training camp, they call it command presence, where they roll onto a scene and they start yelling, and everyone is terrified. Get out of the goddamn ground! I'm like, oh, I'm sorry! Like, felons hand guns back and dive on the ground. He's doing that to me. Where did you get these goddamn flyers? Like, I don't know. But they gave him to me. And he said he'd give me a dollar a year to put them up. I'm sorry. Who's my flag? I don't know. I hate it. They're all people. I mean, I'm stupid. I'm stupid. Give me those goddamn flyers. Get out of here. If I see you get, I'm going to kill you. I'm so sorry. So I go back to SST like seven minutes later with a bucket of weed paste. And my bed, like, did you put the flyer there? No, man, he took him away. <laughs> Here's more flyers. Get back down there, you pussy. <laughs> and this is how I started my life of crime. Anyway, and so uh, I remember that afternoon, and I remember the emotional impact the member of LAPD had on me. And so now I'm about to have a new audience in this band, Black Flag, and I wanted to impact them emotionally as that young member of LAPD had impacted me. And from that day going forward, I started working on and refining my yelling technique. That was well over 40 years ago. And now, it's not even a brag or a boast. It is a statement of fact. I am really good at yelling. I work at it. You can call me Old Yeller. So, I say to Heidi, Heidi, I'm going to deploy command presence. Talk to me on the mean streets of Los Angeles in a three, a two. And I was like, Henry, no! No yelling! You're yelling. Shut up! And so, uh, she's worried if I yell at this guy, I could emotionally scar him for life, which is entirely possible. We humans are not that tough. Like, you can screw us up by yelling. And, like, and what if we can treat each other better and we're not so traumatized all the time? I fully believe that, but I really do have to yell at this guy. So, I said, Heidi, it's called acting, darling, and I'm going in a three. And Henry, no! And I give him the guy's face. You're going to jail today! I hope you like the food. like, no! So, I, Henry, I said no yelling! Going for take two, three. Henry, no! In the middle of, no! The cell phone cut off. To this day, Heidi insists that I hung up on her. I did not. The canyon wall cut the phone off, but the comedic timing was such that she thinks I did it on purpose. I'm like, wow, that was luck. I put the phone away, I turned to yell at the guy, He's gone. He's gone! He's moved to the driver's side in an effort to get out of the driver's side door. In a tribute to the Benny Hill show, I go into the car to chase him through. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the passenger seat, holding on to him with as much as I can get in his windbreaker in one hand, bits of the short brown hair in the other, and I'm this far from his face. Ah, I'm so mad. He's utterly terrified, and he looks at me wide-eyed in fear, and he hits me the second non sequitur of the day. You're just like John Gotti. Like, what does that even mean? 
pondering that, smacks his arm and moves his neck, and he opens the door, and I think he's going to make a left and a left and go to the trunk, open it, grab his backpack, and I'm stunned, which means since I have the key fob in my right rear pocket, I must escape out of the uh, passenger door and run away to be out of proximity of the effectiveness of the key fob. If I'm too close to the car, the car will think that he is me and give him access. And so he falls out of one side, I fall out of the other, and at that moment, we look like a typical male homosexual couple in Los Angeles, breaking up for real this time. The old man with the connection to the money, the young man with the looks and the stamina, it is over. And this probably happens all over Los Angeles. Uh, the young and the old breaking up out of like uh, Lamborghinis and Porsches, but we're breaking up out of a Mazda 6. And so he runs to the trunk, I run that way. And by the time he gets to the trunk, I'm way over yonder. And so he goes to the trunk, it won't open. He's, he's, he's smart, he figures he's like, Give me my backpack. And his voice is really deep. I'm like, uh-oh, we're going to fight, and this is going to end very badly for me. He comes running at me. Somehow he knows the keys are right here, and we're on our feet grappling. And so I block, and I push. And I don't know if you've ever groped a man, but you can get a fairly good read as to a man's muscle density and muscle quotient by grabbing a muscle group and giving it a squeezy squeeze. And so I have the entirety of a man's pectoral muscle group in my mitt, and I push for him. Mm -hmm. Oh no! We're in really good physical shape and one third my age, which translates into I am going to die. And so I push him back a second time and my stamina is just going straight down. I got like one or two more of these and then I'm going to be out of breath. He seems to sense this. He looks at me and he says, you just turned 60. You're too old for this. I'm like, oh no, I'm going to die. And he comes at me and I'm like, Ugh. Then I realize deterrence isn't deterring this guy, which means I need to flip the script and go on the offense. So we square up again, and before he can make a move on me, I let loose with a left fist that leaves the station at the speed of American progress. There it goes. I don't know if people in bars in this beautiful part of Connecticut fight, but maybe you've seen two idiot men who can't fight actually fight, and the punches take about a day and a half to finally arrive. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, spring break. That's the punch I threw at this guy. We both watched like, well, there it goes. <laughs> He's kept on going. And so finally, about a day and a half later, the fist goes whistling by the guy's head. I missed him by about that much. I think the fist made a sound as it went by. They went, whee! <laughs> but there was a reaction from the young man, even though I missed him. Uh, and I saw his shoulders sag, his head tilted forward, and it looks to me like someone's never been in a street fight before. Oh, goody, I've been in them all over the world. <laughs> Thanks, Black Flag! And so I got this with the right fist that leaves the station with far more intensity and accuracy, and it connects solidly and beautifully with his face. Pow! And so, I'm not one who gets off on his appearance. I don't look at him and like, oh my god, you sexy, sunken cheap bastard. You and Amy Pop and Keith Richards. How do you keep doing it? Don't worry, ladies. We're going to keep doing it for you. I never think like that, ever. Whenever I shave my face, which was yesterday, the lizard man is pulling a razor across his face. If the lizard man does not shave every other day, Bright white bristles explode violently from his face, and he looks like your weird uncle who eats squirrels in the park. And so, I'm not high on my own supply, but every great once in a while, I believe the cicadas come out. For like one nanosecond, I am absolutely smitten with myself. And that happened on that moment. Oh, I'm so indie right now. The old man just knocked the crap out of the young man. Oh, you still got it. And so, I'm looking at this guy. He's looking at me, and for the first time that afternoon, I realize he is wearing a blue mask. I touch my face. I am wearing a mask. So think about this. We are not social distancing. We are not washing our hands between physical encounters, but we are both observing basic COVID protocols. Do you understand what this means? It means that this is officially the lamest fight in the history of Southern California. Too lame of <laughs> So what are the ground rules? Well, fight to the death is going to happen, but potentially spreading a virus that informs a global pandemic 
is frowned upon. So that's not going to happen. So you might die of asphyxiation, but not the spread of a virus because, hey, we gotta draw the line somewhere. And so we're these two idiots, like Phil, like we're both at it, but like our, our masks like whiny skins. I'm looking at this young man, he's looking at me, and I see a trickle of blood coming from underneath his mask going down to the collar of his shirt. I'm kind of transfixed watching his progress. And the guy sees me looking at something, and he touches his neck, he sees the blood, and he looks at me and he says, you're smiling. How did he know? I had a mask across my face. How did he know? My eyes were all scrunched up. I didn't say anything because he told me busted me. I was smiling so hard my entire head hurt. And so I realized I, I didn't knock him out. There's no way some 60 year old man is going to stop the youth of today and he's going to kill me. I'm like, well, here we go. Here comes death. And at that moment, two cop cars pull up, four cops get out, and they run across the road and they surround us. What the hell's going on here? And they take the young man across the street and they're questioning him, two cops are questioning me. At one point, one of the cops yells at the two cops with me, hey, our guy says your guy attacked him. I'm so mad at this point, I yell from across the road at the guy, shut up! The two cops with me already kind of sort of digging my action because I bloodied up a young man, but now they see I rock command presses like a pro, fist bumps all around. So I'm like, I'm a friend of the LAPD now. And so I open the trunk, I give him the backpack as his evidence. Uh, the two cops take the young man away. The two cops will be going, okay, we gotta get in our cars, go to your house, make sure there's no one else in there, and do the damage report. I said, okay, follow me. And we go to the driveway, I hit the clicker, and again, the gate won't open. So I find the lowest part of the retaining wall, I hop over, and I go down to the bottom of the driveway because I see something amiss. There's a little metal box at the end of the driveway that corresponds to the clicker. Inside the box, like bells and whistles and, and little light bulbs, the guy had opened up the box and ripped all the wires out. And that's why the gate won't open, because he basically broke it. Which means I am faced with opening these two massive custom steel gate doors with my bare hand. So as a joke, I put my palm against one of the doors and walk forward. It opens with no resistance whatsoever, making my gate a perfect metaphor for Hollywood. It's just mere artifice. I have the illusion of safety. The reality is, your annoying nine-year-old nephew can stand on the street side and pull the gates open with his bare hands like, Come on in, Vikings! Pillage! And so, the cops see me opening this massive steel door with my palm. They're fist bumping inside the car. They totally dig me now. So now we're in the house walking down the narrow hallway that goes from the living room this way, up the stairs to the bedroom and the gymnasium room that way. We see glass coming down like a trail down the stairs, going into the living room, and the glass stops where the carpet starts. And the cops go, check all the windows. I go, you don't need to, here's what happened. He went from the street over the wall, across the parking lot, up the stairs, through a room, down a roof, over a wall, across the deck, through a plate glass window, through a room, down the stairs, to where the carpet is. And the motion detector, that red light picked him up. You turn when the house is alarming, up the stairs, through a room, on a deck, up a roof, through a room, down the stairs, over the wall, and I engage with him a couple of minutes later. The cops are like, how do you do that? I live alone, I talk out loud, like, all the time. <laughs> You want to see a lot of glass? Come with me. I have, a, I have a theory. And we went into the gym room, and there's a cinder block in the middle of the room, which I've never seen on the property before. Maybe he brought it from home. And so uh, that's how he got in. And so we figure there's no one else in the house. So we inspect the third floor, which is the only place he had any time to do anything. And on that floor of the house are a lot of rare punk rock items, uh, things like rare original punk rock artwork of records that you might have. He took some of the coolest stuff I've ever seen as a punk rock collector electric guy, and he smashed it to pieces, which kind of sucks. And so he broke my gate, he broke my window, he broke my stuff, and I probably have to get a lawyer, so I don't like this guy much anymore. So the cops and I are now in the kitchen. I'm answering the questions, they give me a version of the report, and I put it on the kitchen table, and I'm walking the two cops to the front door to let them out. And the older of the two cops squints and stares at me, and I know that, that expression. I've been recognized, the penny has dropped, and he explodes. Dude! Oh, dude, no way! Dude! Dude, I can't believe I'm in your house. Dude, dude, this is rad. Dude, you're an animal. And the young cop's like, dude, dude, why are you calling that dude? Dude, dude, do you know who this dude is? Dude, 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 I know you are, dude. Dude, dude, no way. Dude, dude, that's black flag, dude. That's black flag. The young cop's like, oh, dude, dude. Dude, no way. Dude, dude, my grandfather loved you guys, dude. <laughs> Uh, you look at history books, they talk about back in the day, I was actually there back in 
the day when you can see Husker do for a nickel and, and the amps were powered by coal or oil and like three to five kids would die per song and the band wouldn't stop playing and just throw that dead body on the stage and like three American presidents would be at the show. Anderson, Ian Mackay, oh, it was super eclectic. There's Tom Waits. And so it was a great time. And those days are over. Anyway, uh, the cops leave. And on their way out, one of them says, hey, a detective will be calling you later today. Don't miss that call. And a few hours later, a detective indeed calls. Henry, I'm the detective on the case. Very sorry about what happened to you. I've been talking to the young man all afternoon. He's told me everything. Would you like to know the details? I said, I'd like to know anything. He said, okay, so what do you know? He said, I know he's from Finland. That's all I've got. He said, well, you're correct about that. So apparently, Henry, you go all over the world and you stand on stages and you talk at a high rate of speed for about two hours at a time without any notes or any water. I'm like, yes. He said, well, you did that in 2016 in Helsinki, Finland. The guy was at the show. He loved it, and after the show he went home, and for the first time in his life ever, he starts hearing voices of two varieties. The friendly voices say, hey, Henry's really cool, save your money, fly to Los Angeles, and hang out with him. And the angry voices say, hey man, Henry is saying untrue things about you, ruining your reputation all around town, save your money, fly to Los Angeles, break into his house, and wreck everything you can which is kind of demonstrative of his behavior. Like when the gate opened and he didn't run, because he's not a burglar, in my opinion, he's not a bad guy. He's a young man whose brain is zigging when it should be zagging. And so I said, so wait a minute, let me get this right. He's compelled by the voices in his head to fly from Helsinki to Los Angeles into a taxi and into my house. And the physicist said, no. And this is the craziest part of anything he told me, Henry. You can't fly to the United States from any Scandinavian country right now because of COVID. The young man saved his money. He flew from Helsinki, Finland to Mexico, hiked through the Mexican desert, got into the United States over the Mexico-Texas border, spent two days in Texas. Now you know he's crazy. And then, um, <laughs> Freight trains, like some character in the John Steinbeck novel, finds himself in San Diego, 90 miles south, conveys himself to Hollywood, California, finds your home address in Reddit, thanks, and here we are. And for like a second and a half, I could say nothing. I was floored because this young man reminds me of me. Discipline, focus, tenacity, never lose sight of the objective. But I'm tired. Finish it, son! And so the guy broke my gate and my window and my stuff, and I'll probably have to get a lawyer. Is there any silver lining in this cloud? Yes, think about it. Of all the aging, should have been dead in the last century, but still alive miraculously, still drawing breath, punk rock coelacanths. It is a target-rich environment. Of all of them existing in the United States right now, he picked me, bitches. And so <laughs> there's that. And that'll keep us warm on the weekend. And so I said, what happens to this guy now? He was like, he's in a lot of trouble. Like five felony charges. They'll easily be able to make one to three of them stick. He's looking at real prison time. I said, so what do I do? He said, you get a lawyer, a criminal lawyer. I've never gotten a criminal lawyer before. Contractual lawyers, yeah. But I'm not a criminal, so I don't need that kind of lawyer. And I said, are they expensive? And he kind of laughed and went, no, not bad. Between ten and thirty thousand dollars for a multiple felony. I'm like, ha ha ha, that's funny. If I don't have uh, I've got uh, laughter and levity uh, and humility, but no money, because the anti-science gang cancels one tour after another, and I'm never getting back on the road again. So I said, I don't have that kind of money, you know, that's really not my problem. I went, that's so true. And so uh, he hangs up on me, and I call Heidi, the smart one, who's still kind of angry about the last few phone calls. So what do you want? I go, Heidi, I need a criminal lawyer. I already found you one. She did. She's very resourceful. And so she went to high school with a woman who became a member of LAPD since retired. She still has friends in the business. And she found one of her friends who's a criminal lawyer who's also a fan of mine. And he's going to give me that old school good time punk rock discount. It's so only ten to twelve thousand dollars and not ten to thirty thousand dollars. And I was worried. And so this guy calls a couple of days later. Don't worry, Henry. I'm gonna put this man in prison for a million billion years. I go, you know. Sir, you're the college graduate. I barely crawled out of high school. 
Um, it, could it be that someone maybe doesn't need to go to prison, even though it's a multiple felony charge, I understand the seriousness of it, but maybe in this century we are going to uh, reconcile ourselves to the fact that humans are infinitely complex creatures, and maybe punishment is not what is required every single time someone breaks what is considered a law. Because if you put this young man into prison for over a decade, even if he gets out of good behavior after six years, he will be psychically destroyed for the rest of his life. Maybe he needs care and supervision and pharmaceutical drugs and housing and like experts to make sure he doesn't hear voices in his head anymore. Or maybe we are throwing people into the prison system who need care and they're not criminals, but they did break the law. And I just hear the silence on the other end as like my lawyer concludes, my client's a pussy. <laughs> well, we'll take that under advisement, I gotta go. And so he ends up. And so he calls me a few days later. Okay, there's been some movement. I go, what's happening? Like, well, he's not going anywhere because like, you know, there's no bail for this. But uh, the county of Los Angeles has concluded it's more financially prudent to send him back to Finland and not uh, tax the overburdened prison system in the state of California with like 10 years of medication, supervision, housing, food, and light bulbs and whatever. So he's going to go home. I said, when? He said, well, after his day in court. I said, when is that? He said, well, you know, the wheels of justice are rum for rum. The young man spends 46 days in the psych ward of Twin Towers in downtown Los Angeles, waiting for his day in court. He finally gets his day in court. The detective is there, his lawyer is there, my lawyer is there, the mom has been located in Finland. She's a lawyer. She has flown to the United States via the Finnish consulate. So now this has international intrigue. And the judge, uh, in my opinion, was really cool. He said, young man, listen carefully. Tomorrow morning at 9.30, you're gonna be sprung from jail by that detective sitting behind you, who on his day off is gonna put you in his car, reunite with your mom, who's sitting there, take you to Los Angeles International Airport, throw you into the loving arms of Homeland Security, and you are going to go back to Finland. Young man, listen very carefully to what I'm about to tell you. If you darken the doorway of LA County or anywhere in the United States, in the next 10 years, we will be flagging all of your flights. We will arrest you as soon as you put one foot into any USA airport, and you will report promptly to prison in California and do the entirety of your sentence. Some, you will not like the California prison system. It's something like the summer camp of jail you've been prancing about in for the last month and a half. Son, listen, you never want to see this face again. Do you get it? And the young man said, yes, and I, this is why I like this judge. He said, young man, you got your life ahead of you, so I'm gonna say all of this again. And he read the whole thing one more time, so this young man really gets it and doesn't screw his life up by coming back to the United States and getting incarcerated. And so apparently the young man got it, and the next day, uh, mom and, and kid are thrown into the loving arms of Homeland Security onto a plane and back to Finland. And so in the days afterwards, I paid for a lawyer and gate guy and window guy and Sam to repair the artwork, but sadly didn't come back 100%. I think it is vulgar and juvenile to protest to a wonderful audience about how much you paid for something. The cost was exorbitant, and it sucked, but I paid in full, as you do, and I just kept on going. Like, what else are you gonna do? And so I was angry at this guy for at least three days, and then my anger quickly evaporated as I, as I kind of cooled off, and then I started thinking about him in a completely different way. And the more I thought about him, the more I saw he was a very small part of a very big problem. And I'm not saying I diminished his life. I'm just saying he is one of millions and millions of people all over the world who suffer from some strain of mental illness. And then I thought about that in the United States of America. And so whenever I think about a problem in the US, I pretend that it's my problem and I have to fix it. And that's why I wanted to amend the Second Amendment. I take full responsibility for the problems and even though a lot of my solutions have blood and death of men and it would work, and I know I can't do them, but I come up with the ideas anyway. And so what do I do about the homeless problem in LA County, which is where I was living at that time, which right now has between 55 and 75 thousand homeless people. As you might know, it's a huge county. You could drive for an hour. Where are you? LA. Where in LA? LA. Like, what do you mean? We're in LA. What part? LA. LA. It's just LA. It just goes forever. It's like an unsolvable problem. And so, uh, can you uh, notice 75,000 homeless people on the streets? They're everywhere. And they get lit on fire. And they, they kill each other. They get injured. They medicate with alcohol. Police beat the crap out of them. People beat the crap out of them. They beat the crap out of each other. And people are like, I hate them. I hate these people. And so, okay, Henry, here's 
king of the United States fix the problem? Well, here's what I would do on day one, settle the problem of like hundreds of, of thousands of homeless people all over the United States. I would call uh, that weird Twitter X guy. He's bizarre. I'd say, I need a gajillion, bajillion, million, billion dollars a month to get all of these people uh, off the street into housing, which we have to build with supervision, medication, and therapy, and the rehabilitation programs to try to work them back into the American working world if they can do it. If they can't, we gotta take care of them. Click, okay, Bill Gates, same thing. Click, that weird Facebook guy. Click, they don't hang up on me. And so every once in a while, raw tonnage of, of money can fix a problem. It could fix the problem of homelessness in the United States of America. They're on the street, they need to be off. And so, why do I say this? Because if we're the number one country in the world, if we have the temerity to go all over the world and tell the world to conduct themselves as we do, to give them instructions on morality when we invented napalm, then there should not be a single homeless person on any American street. It should be over. There should be no men talking to phone booths like in the hot sun. And so, I see it as a problem that anyone is living on the street where they free to death or otherwise get harmed or injured. And so my, my solution wouldn't work because no one will give me the money. So uh, alternate solution, what if America had less people in the country, a lesser of a population, and we could take care of fewer people better? And so right now, America endures about 330 million people population. That's an approximate number. What if I could somehow whittle that down to a mere 1 million, which means I have to launder 329 million American lives and not be a nine-month docu-series special on History Channel of the worst person in the history of, of humanity. And so I don't want to kill a lot of people to get the number down to one million, but carpet bombing NASCAR events would be very, very effective. <laughs> the right people would go, the visual would be incredible, and we could watch it again and again and again on our phone, but you can't do that because that's murder, and we're already too good at that. So. My other solution would be to get the biggest megaphone in America and have an 18 to 20 minute uh, a, a scientifically inclined cold sober lincoln -esque speech to breeding age Americans. Listen carefully. I am the king of the United States of America. You breeders, knock it off. You're having three to 15 kids when you don't have the money, the time, or the bandwidth to handle one. You are humans, you are not guinea pigs. Stop breathing like you're a freaking rodent. Stop pawing at each other's pudenda. Which is laughing for the naughty bits. I learned that in seventh grade, I've never been able to let it go. <laughs> in your single white trailer, there must be a book, probably the one by Stephen King about the, the people with the angry car. Read it! Let's stop pulling at each other. Pretend to have kids. Don't really do it! Because the, the, the earth cannot stand it. There's not enough drinkable water. The natural resources are diminishing. Knock it off or we're all done for! And of course, American parents will not listen to me, but if I had my way, within 150 years, we would, with no murder, we would be down to one million population in the United States of America. Do you know what the USA would look like? It would look like your town. Pleasant people, room to move. Not a ton of traffic all the time. Beautiful blue skies. Nature walking around. Metallica would be a club band. It would be so <laughs> Maybe that's the way to go. But as it is now, I see all these kids running around the United States of America absolutely terrified because they don't want to get shot while they're in class. And they have questions because now we're making medical and technological breakthroughs. And still the kids have questions like, what's trans? Am I trans? And I hope the parents are getting scientifically inclined so they can answer these questions of these bright young people. In the 1970s when I was young, I had nothing like that on my mind because there's not that like, breadth and, and depth of knowledge available to me. And so I don't think the parents are adapting to the modern times enough and they're getting reductionist. You're not gay, you just hate America, go to your room. And so these young people, they're not needy, they're just they're curious because they've seen reports of people their age being shot and killed in school. And when they complain about it, they're called crisis actors. So something needs to change. And so since I'll be dead in like the next 14 months, I am an advocate for young people. And this is the weirdest thing I'll ever say to you. I am Flavor Flav and young people are Chuck D, using the public enemy paradigm. Basically, young people are the leader, and I'm the pitch man on the side going, go young person, go! And, and I try to stay out of the way of young people, literally, when they're walking down the street, I, I get out of the way, and it, it's their sidewalk, I'm just getting lost on it. And I want them to grow up and wrest the means of power away from the ancient, pasty old white men who don't know what an ovary is, and take over, because what we have going on now is, in my opinion, not sustainable. It is 
temporary and things will get better as long as young people step up. So I encourage them to do that. And so unfortunately for young people, I like to do a few things that young people like to do. I still go to punk rock shows. Before you were born, when I was young, Ian Mackay and I used to go see Arena Rock at the Capitol Center in Largo, Maryland, and you could see Aerosmith for like $12, and that's all we could see, because that's what we were the age to see. We couldn't go into a bar. And so we would see Aerosmith for like three city blocks from the stage. Like, Steve Perry is this big, or might be some skinny guy with a wig. You never knew. And the music sounded fairly awful, because it's in a hockey arena. By the time the song gets to you, like, you're hearing, like, the first verse. The band is on the third verse. It just takes, like, a day to get to you. And it's tripped over, like, 8,000 wooden chairs, and over five sleeping men covered in vomit. And, like, it was a non event. Like, we'd be in the park, like, was that fun? I don't know. Did it rock? I think it did, and then in one year, I think it was 1979, uh, a seismic change, in one year we saw Led Zeppelin, which was monumental, and then on February 15th, uh, 1979, with Bo opening in front of about 500 people, we saw The Clash, where you can walk right up to the front of the stage, put your stomach against it, and slap your hand down, and hit Joe Strummer's foot. The band is right there. Like, you're not a consumer, you are a co-conspirator, and you can feel it, and you can smell the band sweating, like rock and roll became real, and you see what the magic part of it is. And so I became an expert on surviving a Ramones show. Because by the third song, you're being smashed by all the, the human tonnage, like small club oversold. The strategy to survive, go to that side of the stage and get as close to the front as you can and stand directly in front of Dee Dee Ramone. By the third song, all of your body moisture has been pressed out of your body in a sodium cloud going from your head. And you are dying of dehydration. And this is where Dee Dee literally saves your life. He would sweat profusely, like a faucet coming off his chin. It tasted disgusting, but you put your pot like a lizard. Survive! And so, whenever the cramps would come to Washington, D.C., uh, the legendary band of cramps, we grew up seeing them. They were a New York band that came to D.C. often. And uh, that, you know, D.C. was cramps country. And Ian M and Mackay and I would go right at the front, but we're right there to take it in. And Lux Interior, the legendary front man, would always remember us from the previous time. And I think in early 1980, he sees us at the front, and he comes sliding up on his butt, and he goes like, Fellas, I need you to help me. Take my pants off, because like clothes, Lux hated him. Like, you got it, Mr. Interior. And so we start pulling on his pants from, from the belt, and we peel the jeans off him. And they go inside out. We turn them right side out and fold them neatly and put them on the stage. Like, we are that guy. And so after going to enough house parties, where I'm standing in the living room and watching the Bad Brains play next to a couch in the television, after going to a house party on December 13th, 1980, at 1226 Calvert Street, and in a living room, watching some band called Minor Threat do their first ever show, I have never recovered. And so now that I'm 62, I'm the oldest person in the building when a band plays. And I think it's hilarious. So I stay out of the way of young people for two reasons. I don't want a young person running by me into my pelvis and breaking it, so no, no, no broken pelvis to the young whippersnapper. And I don't want a young person to see some old person screwing up the skyline. And so I stand at the back and I, I, I surveil the show like it's a covert operation. Yet young punk rock men can find me. And I think there's some application you can get from the Apple Store. The find the aging punk rock coelacan we thought had died in the last century but still miraculously still draws breath, the locator app. And so you put it on your phone for $1.99 and you hit the, the phone and you listen to the tone. Go, go tracking, go locate. And these young men come through the dark and they find them. Go, dude, oh dude, no way, I thought you'd be taller. Thanks. I always say, I play the Ritalin, and they never get it. But dude, you're alive. Yeah. Dude, can we do a photo? Who am I to say no? Dude, don't move. Even I can do that. Dude, <laughs> thanks, dude, keep living. Thank you. And they leave, and this happens one to 15 times per show. Because like the rumor some aging punk rock dinosaur is in the venue goes viral. And like two songs later, boom, and I'm already ready. Yes, I'm still alive and short and ready for a photo. Dude, you're a mind reader, sure. And this happens over and over and over again. Every dozen shows or so, a female approaches, and it's kind of the same, but it's radically different. The female comes out of the darkness like a dream. Excuse me. 
Mr. Rollins. And I always say the same thing, think it's going to be funny, and it never is. I always, I always reply, are you calling me Mr. because I'm old? Yes. Like, Ow, damn. <laughs> I was like, walking into a door. Like, did that hurt? Like, can we do a photo? Who am I to say no, young lady? And so um, she takes a moment to line up the shot. She looks around and finds some ambient light in the venue to line up cheekbone, jawline, you know, eye, nose, hair. It all has to be perfect. She's like, okay, yep, yeah. and there it is. Got it. Time to get the phone. No, there, yeah, yeah, about two minutes in. And, and the photo is half great. Half horrible. She informs the great part. She is, as Iggy Pop is wont to say, like a million in prizes. I ruin the photo by looking like some weird old dude sabotaging a selfie as I kind of wander through the photo. Is this the way to the park? Because I am talking when I should be posing. So she's like striking the move, and I'm like, Did you know this venue was built in 1914? <laughs> And it was a slaughterhouse for 43 years, and then a post office. And in 1976, it was bought by two Hungarian brothers who were new entrepreneurs, and it's been a music venue under different names ever. <coughs> and that's when the photo gets taken. So she's like, and I'm like, I'm like, ma'am, I demand a redo. And she goes, like, You're not getting a redo. That took three and a half minutes to pose that photo. I'm like, ma'am. You're not getting a redo. So she's multitasking. Uh, she's winning the argument and she's pummeling her phone with her thumbs, putting in some kind of sentiment underneath this half ridiculous photo. Ma'am, are you going to send that to someone? I just did. Who did you send that photo to? My father. Your father? Why? Because if he finds out I met you and I didn't get photographic proof of life, he'll never believe me. He thinks you're dead. <laughs> we all do. About 30 seconds later, a text comes back from Dad. No way! I thought I'd be taller! <laughs> if only your grandfather was alive to see this! Thanks, good night. <laughs>